Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Araceli Campa Ramirez, Senior Deputy Director for External Affairs and Policy here at GoBiz. A few quick comments before we get started. This call is meant as a briefing for our stakeholder and legislative partners. If you're a member of the media, we'd ask that you hang up now. We will be taking questions at the end. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit them at any point during the call today using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen and indicate who the question is for. I'd now like to introduce our presenters for today. We will have Dee Myers, Director of GoBiz and Senior Advisor to the Governor, Gail Miller joining us, uh, Chief Deputy Director, Department of Finance. I'd also like to acknowledge additional finance team members on our call, Amy Jarvis, Jay Chamberlain, Ryan Miller, and Teresa Kelper, who will all be available to answer questions at the end. We have Tara Lynn Gray, our Director of the Office of Small Business Advocates, uh, Tyson Eckerly, our Deputy Director for Zev Market Development here at GoBiz. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to Director Myers to get us started. Uh, so Didi, if you'd like to kick us off. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks, Araceli, for kicking us off. And thanks to all of you for joining us on this call today. Um, great to have you. As you know, Governor Newsom rolled out his $286 billion proposed budget yesterday in a brief two hour and 50 minute discussion. Um, so despite all that, there's still a lot to unpack. Uh, and this afternoon, we wanna go a little deeper on the parts of the budget that affect uh, GoBiz and the programs and issue areas that we manage. So we'll walk you through some of the details uh, and then take your questions. Unfortunately, uh, fortunately, we have our friends from the Department of Finance, as Araceli noted. Uh, and before we start, I just want to thank them for their incredible hard work and partnership throughout this process. Uh, they've been amazing, starting with the Chief Deputy Director, Gail Miller, as well as her team, Ryan, Jay, Amy, and Teresa. So thanks to all of you and to the rest of you. I know they'll be super helpful in answering any questions that you have. Um, as you all know, this budget was built as we continue to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic and the aftermath of the recession that it caused, the worst our state and country have faced since the Great Depression. Uh, and while our recovery has been really impressive by historical standards, uh, and it was definitely aided by federal and state emergency assistance programs, there's still a lot more work to be done, especially in the industries and communities that were hardest hit. Um, as you've all heard Governor Newsom say, an equitable and broad-based recovery is a top, top priority for this budget and the policies it includes. So you'll hear a lot about that as we go through this, um, not just in our conversation today, but across the budget process. Um, so, you know, again, to the point of the recession, California lost more than 2.7 million jobs in March and April of 2020. But thanks to state and federal assistance, uh, we were able to mitigate many of the worst impacts. That said, the spiking unemployment rate had a huge impact on the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund and left us with a substantial debt. Uh, so to address that, the governor has proposed uh, $3 billion over two years to pay down part of that debt uh, and in turn help reduce the cost that businesses will have to pay going forward. Uh, in addition, uh, the budget uh, proposal restores the temporary limitation on the use of net, net operating loss deductions and business tax credits, including uh, the research and development tax credit, the R&D tax credit, that's one year earlier than planned. Uh, and that's something we've certainly heard from a lot of our stakeholders about. So uh, we're, we're grateful to start with those two big ticket items uh, and uh, we'll, we'll have lots more to say. So uh, before we dive into more of the details around uh, the programs, I'd like to turn it over to Gail Miller, who's gonna just give us a broad overview of the budget and kind of set us up. So Gail, over to you. Thank you so much, Didi, and it's been a true pleasure to partner with, um, with Araceli and Didi and Chris and Kaina and everyone at GoBiz. So thank you so much for everything you're doing and Tara as well. Um, and of course, to the Department of Finance, I know so many of you on the call. I know many of you. Um, thank you for joining. I know that all of you will turn to the work that the team at Department of Finance does in our A pages. I'm gonna share just a couple slides, but there's a lot of great information in there. And for those of you that don't know Ryan Miller, he oversees all our forecasting and revenues 
He um, comes to us from the LAO and then Jay Chamberlain on the tax pieces, Teresa Calvert on workforce and Lithium Valley and energy and Amy Jarvis on many general government issues, including Go Business Budget um, and helped create the small business grants as well. So just a huge debt of gratitude to the people at finance. Um, so just really, really briefly, I'm gonna share a couple, oops, but I need to be able to share. Um, I just wanna share just a couple slides to give you perspective on why budget resiliency and reserves, although I know all of you know this, um, but why it's so important that we continue to really focus on reserves. We are um, obviously very aware of what it means to have volatile revenue in terms of, of these capital gains. And we know that kind of what goes up must come down. This is not going to be consistent. It never has been since we started tracking them in 1970. And you can see, and I think all of you probably followed Chairman Powell's confirmation hearing today, we are, we don't know what's to come. So as Keeley said yesterday, we locked down our estimates in November. And as you will recall, in November, we barely knew about Omicron. We certainly did not know that it would be so fast spreading. And we, we thought inflation was stickier. So those are questions. And we didn't know about the Fed actions. So as we all know, your, your estimates are as good as your assumptions. You'll start to see these revised with the May revision. We remain mindful of the fact that we fluctuate along with the rest of the world and the economy. So this is, it's really important to keep in mind. The other, I think, really great slide in our May revision is, uh, and th these are all in the revenue chapter at the end of the A pages, and again, linked at eBudget. Um, it's on this slide, ebudget.ca.gov. The other piece is sort of what our recovery looks like. So, you know, I think there were a bunch of articles actually today in the New York Times about the uneven recovery. That remains something that we continue to work on. I'm going to speak to those two pieces in just one second. But what's surprising about this recovery compared to our other recessions, and the team did a really good job mapping out the previous four recessions, is how significant and rapid the job losses and years to recovery are. So we know, and as, um, as Didi said, a lot of that does have to do not only with our own revenues and ability to invest, but also with the federal investments. So if, if we can remain on track, you can see a pretty steady uh, pathway to recovery. So we hope to continue on that as we move forward. The, I, I did want to put the slide back up. I promise you this is not going to go. I only have one more slide. Um, just so you know, when we talk about the reserves, I like to just clarify what's included. This slide, as you can see, does not include all the, the ways that we're paying down the retirement liabilities, but it is really important to know the four different uh, the four different funds that go into our overall reserves, just so that you can see how the governor came up with this total number of 34.6. And it's this rainy day fund that has the 10% limitation that's constitutional. So you'll continue to see us talking about that. Ryan Miller, who's on the call, is an expert on SAL. If you have questions on the state um, appropriations limit in terms of what we have to and don't have to do. I'm going to show you this slide and then just stop sharing, but this is the, I'm going to talk about sort of three really brief things today, um, in addition to why budget stability is so important and that we do not know what's coming, although we're grateful to all of you for helping speed our recovery, is workforce and what that looks like, housing and homelessness, and um, generally our, our glide path into this recovery as we go forward. So in terms of K-12, this is Prop 98, which includes our community colleges. It's an extraordinary increase in investments, especially with state money. Just to keep in mind that you know, we're going to test one, but we do keep building on these investments as we build our budget. So that's always something to keep in mind as we look forward into, into what the future looks like for the state. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and just talk to you really, really briefly about our workforce investments, but I do hope that you'll also just look at our, at our budget generally. 
and make sure that, that you get all the information. So in addition to that investment in K-12, this is the biggest investment in higher education. So what you'll start to see, we've invested again, free community college, but a lot of pathways, which are these learn to earn programs so that we're connecting curriculum with jobs. So you really start to see those two pieces come together. And the other thing is that you'll see these long-term commitments to UC and CSU so that we have that degree attainment goal, which is not just at a four-year university, Those that 70% degree attainment goal also includes vocational education, credentials, a two-year associate's degree, things of that nature. But we're very committed to this idea that higher education remains really important. And in terms of workforce, recognizing the great resignation and what we can do to help with that, you'll see commitments to apprenticeships. And I think this is something we'd love to be able to work with you and on in the future. Didi and I just had a call the other day about what internships and apprenticeships can look like at businesses, how we can connect folks with community colleges if you're not hearing back. So would love some creative thinking around that. I think it's really, really important. There's also sort of two big categories of career investments. One is in this clean energy sector, and there's multiple workforce investments in that, including the 35 million for the UC to create a regional workforce, and then 30 million for the community colleges with this very specifically with this idea of focusing on climate change and climate jobs. And then another 60 million goes to the California Workforce Development Boards. And you'll see in addition to that, there, what we're investing in is the Community Economic Resilience Fund, because we completely recognize that parts of the states as they uh, part of the state, as we have this transition, it's really important to support communities and support folks who are doing these incredibly difficult jobs and make sure that we really honor that as well. So the, um, the next piece, and I, I just want to do a quick time check because I know that you all have all this information as well, is housing and homelessness. Um, you know, it is really, really hard. This has to be a partnership with local governments. They do make a lot of the decisions about where to build, how to build, with whom to build. There, is, there are more state resources in this area than we've ever had before. There's 500 million again in the, the affordable housing low income tax credit that's administered by the treasurer. And that'll bring the total of that credit up to $2 billion. So we have more housing in the pipeline certainly than ever before, more affordable and more multifamily. And the demand is even greater than, than what we're able to give out in part because as you probably all know, we're somewhat limited by the tax exempt volume cap that we get from the federal government that's, administ that's administered by the debt limit allocation committee. There's additionally 1.5 billion in general fund dollars that are focused on what we're calling downtown oriented developments. So these climate safe ideas, which include um, infill infrastructure, and those are really statewide. So we're hoping that between this combination of leveraging private capital, tax exempt financing, and general fund dollars, we'll continue to see more and more housing coming online. In terms of homelessness, and I know there were a lot of questions about this yesterday, especially as we all drive and walk around. Um, last year, as the governor spoke about, there was a $12 billion allocation. Two billion of that has already gone out. And we are continuing to put more and more of that out with those housing accountability plans that he spoke to. And then the budget has a $2 billion commitment over the next two years to continue to address homelessness. And that includes some of the services that are so vital to making sure folks get off the street, like behavioral health and encampment cleanups for local governments. So I know there's so much more in this budget that you're interested in. We're happy to answer any questions, happy to work with you offline. But again, we completely recognize that, that the reason for our economic growth is are the folks that continue to stay in California and invest in California. 
and we are obviously grateful for it. We take it seriously. We don't take any of the revenue that comes in for granted. And we, again, would really like to be able to work together, especially as it relates to more tangible ways that we can bring more folks into our workforce as we remain a little bit concerned about how and when our income inequality starts to, starts to at least get a little bit better. So with that, I'll turn it back to the director and, and look forward to questions at the end. Um, thank you, Gail, as always, uh, for your hard work and all uh, everything that we've gotten done. Um, okay, so with that, we're now gonna just dig into a little more of the specifics that you heard yesterday about additional tax credits, uh, in addition, again, to the restoration of the NOL de deduction and the R&D credit. Um, we have two new credits uh, that we're excited about. The first is called the Innovation Headquarters Credit. It's a program for California headquartered companies uh, that invest in activities and technologies that mitigate climate change. So it's a $250 million per year for three years uh, uh, program to, uh, and again, on top of the existing R&D tax credit that will be administered by the Franchise Tax Board. So again, just to accelerate investment um, in uh, clean climate mitigating technologies. The second uh, similar vein is called the Green Energy Technologies Credit, which will be $100 million uh, per year for three years. And it will fund pre-development costs for technologies like electric vehicle manufacturing and infrastructure, geothermal lithium extraction and battery manufacturing, long duration storage, uh, methane emissions uh, projects or, or projects to address methane emissions, and hydrogen technologies that can help reduce the use of natural gas. Um, the credit will be awarded by a yet to be created board, a clean energy board that will live at Govis, but will work certainly across government and the private sector to set that up and to set up the terms. Um, and the idea here is that Californians can share more broadly in the gains from some of these kinds of innovation through this credit, which will be structured so that if a business becomes profitable, a share of those profits will be repaid to the state. Uh, and that can be a perpetuating fund uh, that again will benefit all Californians, but also provide additional funds for these kinds of technologies. Um, we're also proposing, uh, on, moving on with additional credits, uh, we're also proposing that the state conform with the federal tax treatment of the Federal Restaurant Revitalization Fund and the Federal Shut Shuttered Venue Operators Grant. That's similar to the PPP uh, uh, conformity that we put forward last year. Um, we're also expanding the recently enacted elective pass-through entity tax, and that provides some business owners with the ability to mitigate the impact of that limit on federal deductibility for state and local taxes. Um, that was part of the uh, Trump tax plan. Uh, business owners will be able to use the pass-through entity tax credit to reduce the taxes they owe below their tentative minimum tax, the TMT. Um, the budget also proposes to allow a single member limited liability company to participate in the tax and credit program. So that's a change. Uh, for low and middle income households, there's a proposed tax, uh, uh, a tax payment flexibility program. So for families with less than $150,000 in adjusted gross income or $75,000 for individuals, they can take advantage of an interest-free payment plan for taxes owed and be relieved of late fines and penalties, uh, of course, except in cases of fraud. Um, the plans have to make installment payments and be fully paid by September 30th, 2023. 2023. Um, but again, another way to help people um, manage the burdens of the, uh, of the COVID-induced recession. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit more about small business. And, and before I turn it over to Tara Gray, who you all know is the director of the Office of the Small Business Advocate, I wanna talk briefly about the State Small Business Credit Initiative, the SSBCI. I know a lot of you are familiar for, uh, with that program from a previous uh, iteration. Um, it's a, the SSBCI is a federal program that provides funding to states, territories, and eligible municipalities to expand existing or to create new state small business investment programs. Um, so California is set to receive $1.2 billion in funds through the program, through the current allocation. And Scott Wu and the rest of our iBank team are working with the state treasurer's office on a plan to split that money evenly um, between the two departments. Basically, they'll ex allocate a billion dollars, uh, or they're proposing to allocate a billion dollars to existing programs in GOBIS 
and in the treasurer's office, and then provide an additional $200 million to create a new venture capital bank, pro, venture capital program at iBank. Uh, and that venture capital program will be directed at underrepresented venture capital managers, underserved entrepreneurs and business owners, geographic areas that are socioeconomically disadvantaged or that receive generally limited venture capital funding and for uh, climate equity and justice and climate justice uh, uh, programs so or businesses. Uh, so we're excited about the opportunity this will create for our existing businesses to expand and grow and for new businesses um, to get that critical early funding to address gaps in the market. Uh, so with that, I want to hand it over to Tara. Thank you, Didi, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to walk us through several of the new small business proposals. Uh, first, we are continuing the California Small Business COVID-19 Relief Grant Program to capture any applicants that remain unfunded. And due to the high demand for the program, approximately 150,000 small businesses are still on the wait list. Therefore, the budget includes a total of $150 million general fund in 2022 to 23 to provide grants to those qualified applicants. Of this total amount, 20 million will be reallocated from the undersubscribed nonprofit cultural institution grants and an additional investment of 130 million will cover those remaining. Next is an expansion and rebranding of the California Inclusive Innovation Hub Program, known as iHub2. The budget includes an additional $20 million general fund to be spent over four years. First, to expand the number of hubs from 10 to 13 across um, the state, and second, establish the Entrepreneurship Fund to provide grants of up to $100,000 per business for five new businesses incubated at each of the hubs. These grants are intended to encourage science and technology-based business creation in traditionally underserved communities by leveraging the Innovation Hub Program. Additionally, we are proposing to rebrand the program to Accelerate California Inclusive Innovation Hubs. We are also proposing to expand and extend the Small Business Technical Assistance Program, which we call TAPE. The budget includes 6 million general fund in 22-23 to bolster the technical assistance expansion program. This will help us handle the increased demand and 23 million ongoing general fund to permanently support the program. This number is based on three factors, average annual demand to date, the number of extensions granted for centers that fail to spend down the entire amount of their award in the program year and the amount of funds that have been returned to the program to date. In addition, the budget includes 3 million ongoing general fund beginning 2324 to support the continuation of the capital infusion program, which supports one on one business consulting provided by our small business development center network to assist small businesses in accessing capital. We're also pleased to let you know that there is a proposal for Secretary of State fee waivers for new businesses. The budget includes $39.8 million to waive Secretary of State filing fees on a one-time basis for all new businesses registering with the Secretary of State from July 1, 2022 through June 30th, 2023. We're hoping this will encourage business growth in California. And finally, as announced earlier, the budget indicates a proposal for $20 million in grants for small businesses victimized by retail theft. 
At this time, I'm going to hand it over to Tyson Eckerly, Deputy Director for the ZEV Market Development. All right. Well, thank you very much, Tara. And there, there are a lot of numbers, ZEV related numbers in the budget that we'd like to call your attention to. But to start, I'd like to briefly put the numbers in context. Last year's $3.9 billion three year commitment set us on a path to do a number of really big things. Close the infrastructure gap for light duty passenger vehicles for both plug in and hydrogen, and greatly increase access to ZEVs for low income drivers, and enable the adoption of over 1,000 zero emission drainage trucks, 1,000 transit buses, and 1,000 school buses, among other multi sector investments. This year's budget does even more and doubles down. It targets $6.1 billion over the next five years, bringing the total six year investment to $10 billion on a number of pivotal market segments, all with a focus on driving equity and scale. The proposed uh, passenger vehicle investments are a key example. 100% of the over $1.1 billion investments are focused on low income drivers and residents um, through purchase support and really deep investments in infrastructure. Our proposed investments in big ZEVs, there's nearly $4 billion, will deeply expand zero emission drayage, adding another 1,000 trucks, uh, transit, which adding another 1,600 transit buses, zero emission, and school bus adoption, which is up to 3,000 electric school buses, um, really kind of enabling substantial zero emission opportunity and also enabling zero emission opportunities in the ports. The budget proposes 200 million to invest in emerging zero emission opportunities like maritime, rail, aviation, and off-road, giving California another tool to ensure we continue to be the leading test bed, incubator, and economic development hub for the technologies that provide solutions in our hardest to reach sectors. Rounding out the proposal, we have um, 419 million dedicated to low-income community-driven bottom-up mobility projects, really to increase access to zero emission mobility in communities that need it the most following their lead. Um, all of these investments tie directly back to our collective ZEV market development strategy, which organizes our efforts collectively around four pillars of the ZEV market. It's vehicles, infrastructure, end users, and workforce. And we have investments in each section. Our ongoing commitment, especially in the context of all the federal money, infrastructure money coming in, is to increasingly make these programs seamless and accessible to the end user, giving California residents, workers, and business owners every reason to say yes to zero emission vehicles. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Articelli for a few additional budget points. So thank you. Thank you, Tyson, for that great overview. Um, I'd just like to briefly mention the a couple of components in the Local Government Budget Sustainability Fund. As Gail mentioned earlier on the call, regional leaders are working to implement the Community Economic Resilience Fund, known as SURF. The state has the potential to complement these efforts and provide bridge funding to local entities that are working to reap the economic benefits of California's transition to carbon neutrality. The governor's budget will include trailer bill language to create a grant program aimed at local entities facing significant challenges to their near-term sustainability that demonstrate a clear commitment to advancing a more climate resilient local economy. This program will help bridge the gap between counties facing short-term threats to their ability to support core services while empowering them to pursue economic diversification initiatives and projects that will provide long-term stability and create quality jobs. In addition, the budget includes 100 million general fund dollars in each of the 23-24 and 24-25 budget cycles, and an additional 250 million in 25-26 for a total of 450 million to support this program. I also want to briefly mention a few additional proposals around international trade and immigration integration. There will be $2 million to scale the statewide expansion of the export training network and support business growth and resiliency strategies that are overseen by the International Affairs and Trade Unit here at GoBiz. Additional funding is provided for trade missions along the California-Mexico border to promote cross-border economic development. And 8.7 million one-time competitive funding will be available over a three-year period for local governments to start or expand positions to one, build trust with immigrant residents and two, to help immigrant populations navigate state and local services with priority on quality of life, workforce and entrepreneurship supports. A new position within our international team here at GoBiz will oversee and coordinate these initiatives 
and also serve as liaison with regions and local communities on topics related to immigration. To learn more about these and other related efforts, stakeholders can tune in on Thursday at noon. There will be a call on immigration integration aspects of the budget. Um, and more of that will, will be shared uh, at the end of our call today. And with that, I'd like to turn this back over to Didi. She will be providing a couple of additional remarks and closing us out before we begin Q&A. Um, Didi? Uh, thank you, Arceli, appreciate that. Um, okay, before we open it up for your questions, I want to talk briefly about two other sectors that are uh, covered in, in the budget. The first is ports and supply chain. Um, as we all know, COVID has had a substantial impact on the global supply chain, including here in California. It's touched every node along the path and in particular our ports. Uh, as you all know by now, the LA Long Beach Port Complex is, one of, is the busiest in, in the Northern Hemisphere, one of the busiest in the world. And it accounts for 40% of our nation's imports. And so while the ports here in California are city owned, they're enormously important to our state economy, to our businesses, workers, and consumers. And so that's why the governor committed an unprecedented amount of state funds to support the ports, $2.3 billion in total. Um, you know, $1.2 billion uh, will be for port specific high priority infrastructure projects that will increase goods movement capacity on rail and roadways at port terminals. It includes rail yard expansions, new bridges, and zero, zero emission modernization projects. So that's um, CalSTA. Uh, then uh, back to zero emissions, there's $875 million for zero emission port equipment, uh, short haul drayage trucks and, and, and uh, drayage supporting infrastructure. Uh, and then there's $110 million, which will be allocated over three years for a new training campus. This is something that's really important to the ports uh, and to labor and to many of the stakeholders uh, in, in the supply chain. And that'll support workforce resilience uh, in the supply chain disruption and accelerate the deployment of zero emission equipment to help train people how to use the zero emission equipment and to prepare uh, for uh, the clean port and infrastructure and um, uh, supply chain infrastructure of the future. So uh, that's in the workforce chapter, but we're very excited to work with our uh, supply chain partners on that as well. And there's another $40 million in the budget to enhance California's capacity to issue commercial driver's licenses. So that's something that the governor stood up as part of his executive order uh, at the end of last year and in the beginning of this year. So that'll be expanded on. Uh, and then finally, there's $30 million uh, that uh, for GoBiz to help provide funds for operational and process improvements at the port. Uh, so for example, this could include enhancing the movement of goods and improving data interconnectivity between the ports to enable more efficient cargo movement, reduce congestion, uh, and create opportunities to increase cargo volume by promoting and building supply chain efficiency. So uh, that would be something that would benefit the supply chain across the entire state uh, and really, again, be something that California could uh, lead on. Um, finally, I want to talk just for a second about uh, the travel and tourism industry. As we've heard many times that, and as we've seen uh, in all the workforce and um, you know, economic data, that's been a particularly hard hit sector. Um, the governor committed $90 million last year to marketing through Visit California. And there's another $45 million one-time general fund uh, support in this year's budget to continue helping that strategic, those strategic uh, media campaigns to help that industry recover. So uh, very excited to continue to work with um, the uh, travel and tourism sector as, as it continues its recovery. We know how important that is to driving broader economic recovery across the state. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're excited uh, about all of these investments uh, and all the work that we at GoBiz with our partners across government and in the private sector are gonna be able to do around this uh, funding of over the course of the next year. So anyway, thank you for tuning in. And with that, I turn it back to Araceli uh, who can lead us in Q&A. Fantastic, thank you, Didi. Um, and we will go ahead and, um, if you haven't done so already, please submit your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and indicate who the question is for. Um, thank you to those who have already submitted questions. Um, a few of those have received responses and you should all be able to see those responses. So please definitely take a look at those. Um, we will go ahead and start off. Uh, there's a question whether there will be any funding available for disproportionately impacted businesses 
for nonprofits for COVID safety compliance, including access to tests. This is becoming a major cost of business concern, particularly in the performing arts live events industry. So I'll punt that maybe to uh, perhaps Tara or Didi. Um, well, there is, and, and, and actually not to keep handing off, but there, there, there are no business specific, sector specific COVID testing programs, um, but the governor announced on Sunday uh, his investments for COVID relief and COVID mitigation more broadly. And uh, part of that was supporting additional testing. So Gail or uh, Department of Finance, I don't know if any of, any of you has more specifics you wanna to touch on on the COVID program? We don't at this time. We're gonna check with our colleagues at the Department of Public Health and get back to you. It's a, we appreciate the question though. Excellent, thank you. All right, moving on to the next question. Uh, this one's for Tara. Is the small business take proposal for 22-23, 6 million in total, um, 23 million in total, or something <laughs> else? <laughs> Um, okay, so there is an additional six million on top of um, the 17 million traditionally allocated, and then there is a permanent expansion at 23 million. Does that answer the question? Okay, I'll let them respond if we need to elaborate further, but for now we will continue. Thank you, Tara. Um, we're asking, being asked for additional details on Lithium Valley. Um, Dee, Dee, I don't know if you'd like to take that question and just providing additional information on the program. Um, yeah, so um, we're very excited about Lithium Valley more broadly uh, as, as an opportunity. Uh, we think there's um, both a really important um, resource there that's a critical component of lithium batteries, lithium ion batteries uh, need lithium. And we think that California has one of the, you know, world's great untapped um, stores of lithium, uh, including a mile beneath the surface um, near the Salton Sea. Uh, and one of the uh, really exciting parts of the opportunity is that there's also hydroelectric uh, power there. And, and so there's an opportunity to create a clean, up, uh, clean process for extracting the lithium and producing hydroelectric power at the whole, at the whole uh, you know, simultaneously. So those would co-operate together. Uh, in addition, the broader goal is to create a lithium battery supply chain here in California to have the lithium uh, manufacturing of batteries. And then of course, use that for everything from clean vehicles to um, battery storage for homes or um, you know, other, other uh, industrial uses and things like that. Uh, so we're very excited. So part of what, we, what the governor has asked us to do is uh, as state government, not just GoBiz, is to work to expedite permits um, to make sure that we can move that industry forward, but to do so uh, in a way where we work closely with the communities to make sure that communities participate in the benefit of lithium uh, and, of, and of, the, of hydroelectric power and other resources that will come out of that. As you know, Imperial Valley and the Salton Sea areas have been particularly hard hit. Uh, they're they're uh, places that are already ha have higher than, than average poverty rates. So we think that by working together, we can create a new model. We can both create a supply, a, a, a local supply chain for lithium batteries. We can make sure that benefits are shared more broadly and we can create a model for how to develop resources in the future in clean technologies that again, provide benefits for a wider uh, group of people. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Tyson, is there anything that you want to add to that? Well, I think that 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 captures it, Didi. I mean, it's it's a huge opportunity within our ge geography to really drive an innovative ecosystem that benefits multiple people and gives us a robust supply chain. We need to really expand the market. Yeah, and you know, we did. I did talk earlier about the green energy technology credit um, that would be available to. Um, to certain to regions outside the Lithium Valley, but also inside the Lithium Valley. So um, as well as the, uh, for existing industries, the innovation headquarters credit, if, if, the, if, there are, if there are industries there that are California based, companies there that are California based, they could take advantage of the innovation headquarters credit. And then anybody working to develop these new green energy technologies could potentially take advantage of of the of the hundred million dollar green energy technologies credit as well, so uh, we're really excited about the opportunity more broadly. 
Excellent. Thank you, Didi and Tyson. Moving on, this next question is for uh, Tara. Uh, there are reasons why 20 million remains in the Cultural Institutions Relief Grant Program, including that the recommendations arts and cultural advocates made were not incorporated. There is still a significant and vital need for relief funding for arts and cultural institutions, many of which are now reclosing because of Omicron. Wouldn't a better use of that 20 million be to support the cultural institutions it was intended to support rather than redirect to small businesses? Thank you for the question. Um, unfortunately, at the time, the original um, arts and cultural institution um, rollout was done, I was not a part of the team. So I um, didn't have an opportunity to hear and incorporate um, anything that might have been provided at the time. However, we do have um, uh, additional funding from the previous budget that we will be rolling out to support um, the arts in the form of uh, workforce um, grant. And additionally, I would be interested in hearing uh, those recommendations that were not heard previously and uh, take them under advisement uh, moving forward. Excellent, thank you, Tara. Um, next question is around uh, affordability of childcare. Uh, perhaps Gail and, and the finance team, some uh, support here with what funding is being provided to help increase childcare providers and the affordability of childcare. Um, yes, so there are, Ryan, do you know the specifics off the top of your head? The budget does make a big investment in both in subsidized childcare, and then obviously there's the ongoing investment into universal pre-kindergarten for every student, adding a whole nother year of school, but Ryan may know the specifics on childcare better than I. I don't, I, I think I'd have to reference folks to the chi early childhood section of the eight pages, I think, the budget summary document. Thank you. We'll go ahead and post that in the chat, out of silly, so Perfect. they can um, access it that way. Sounds great, we will do that, thank you. Um, moving on to uh, the next question, can you share the governor's efforts to delete the divide for small businesses operating in underserved communities? Tara, you want to take that? that? I was just going to say, is that one for me? Um, so we have a, a, a number of, of programs and actually um, have stood up as one of our priorities in the department, economic mobility. So we are in virtually every program that we are rolling out, we are considering and um, looking to expand to underserved areas underserved populations, um, recognizing that um, the immigrant communities um, significantly contribute to small business activity and success in, in California. We are underscoring inclusivity in every single one of our programs. And as a matter of fact, all of our tape providers um, when they submit their proposals um, for grant funding, have to show us exactly how they are developing inclusivity and adding new levels of inclusivity with every program year. So simply to put it, every program that we are rolling out, um, inclusivity is at the heart. Fantastic, thank you, Tara. Um, back to Didi. Uh, what are the geographic areas that are considered socioeconomically disadvantaged for the 1.2 billion small business credit initiative SSBCI? Um, well, we'll have to establish, I, I don't know whether the metrics have been established. Obviously, there's a tremendous amount of data. Um, and, and we know, uh, for example, what, what um, districts, what areas have below um, average wages, economic activity, and things like that. And so I don't know if they've established that yet, but it will be very data driven. Uh, and again, we have a lot of different options for collecting data to make sure that we're targeting uh, those most impacted um, areas. So, you know, for example, Tara, maybe you can talk a little bit just as an example of how it was done for the Small Business Relief Grant Program. 
Well, actually, Dini, if I could just really refer to the federal definition that we are going to follow here. Um, the federal law speaks specifically to SETI individuals, S-E-D-I, and those are the socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. And the definition, definition used by the federal government is really those that have experienced discrimination or economic hardship in the country. So it is less based on a geographic definition than it is a socioeconomic definition. We have quite a few tools here in the state um, that we could use to um, create those geographic definitions. Um, for example, Cal Screen, which has been used by many um, uh, agencies and takes us right down to the zip code level and um, can determine, you know, and, and inform poverty index, health indices, et cetera. And so I suspect, as Didi said, as we develop those guidelines that we'll be looking to correlate those tools that we have here in California with the definitions that have been provided to us by the federal government. Thanks, Tara. Thank you. All right, moving on. Uh, Didi, another question for you regarding ports. Uh, the 30 million for operations and process improvements at the port. Do we have more details on this proposal and will there be an opportunity for stakeholders to engage? Uh, no, that's a general um, uh, you know, uh, uh, allocation of funds for us to help address those issues. In particular, the governor was interested in can we help um, the different stakeholders in the supply chain community stand up a, um, a uh, data platform that's, uh, that, that can um, you know, be used, accessed by, by different existing um, data uh, um, technologies? So, so, that's, so that's interoperable and it can talk to each other. So that was one piece that we will certainly be pursuing. Um, we don't have any details on that yet, but of course, we're always interested in what people think would be, you know, in, in hearing from the community and the stakeholders, uh, what we think would be additive and could help us uh, make the supply chain more resilient and more efficient going forward. Thank you, Didi. Uh, we have a question here for Tyson regarding ZEV infrastructure. How much infrastructure do you expect to get installed with the new state and federal funding? Does this meet what is needed to meet the governor's ZEV vehicle deployment goals? Yeah, great question. So yeah, we are on track with last year's budget to meet the 2025 needs. And this year's budget helps us get to the 2030 needs. So just using DC fast chargers as an example, last year's budget put us on path to 10,000 DC fast chargers. This should increase it to about 15,000 by 2025, which is more in line with the 100% ZEV adoption goal. And then 40,000 fast chargers in the state by 2030, which also keeps us on path to that 100%. Um, medium and heavy duty is a little bit harder to define. The infrastructure really will ena enable vehicle adoption as far as numbers, but we expect all those um, the investments from the Air Resources Board side on vehicles and the Energy Commission side on infrastructure are coupled to make sure that we're keeping pace and balancing both of those pillars. Thank you, Tyson. And while I have you, there's a follow-up question here about hydrogen expansion and whether funds cover investments and conversions of biomass to hydrogen. So that one I'll have to defer to the um, in the energy section, but there's a there's a section here on green hydrogen, which is really focused in on electrolytic production. Um, that doesn't mean we also have other options for um, funding and supporting biomass to hydrogen. But I think that. 100 million in the budget was conceived for electrolysis. Thank you, Tyson. And then I have one final one here for you for the moment. Um, this one is in regard to uh, infrastructure um, and performance standards. So there's a question about, um, it's for coming from a nonprofit that educates drivers on switching to driving electric. Um, unfortunately, these and other EV drivers experience deep and widespread issues with public charging infrastructure namely stations are down and are failed to complete a charge. Um, issues have been reported in the press, yet no empirical research. Will monies be allocated to research and make improvements in the installed infrastructure? Will the new infrastructure be held to improve performance standards? Yeah, so all the stations in the Energy Commission will have a more deep dive on this later, but 
uh, they really focus all their investments, making sure that um, reliability is a core part of it. In fact, it's one of their action items in their zero emission vehicle action plan under the Z market development strategy to track and improve reliability. It's an ongoing challenge. I think the, the challenge is a lot of it's anecdotal. And so we're trying to get our hands around, you know, more from a data-driven perspective. I think that, you know, we hear that, um, the, the challenges and the problems that so there's a lot of success stories out there as well. And so that is a key area of focus for the Energy Commission that's been identified and we'll be focused on it going forward. Excellent, thank you, Tyson. I have a, another question here regarding UI trust fund. Um, and this was mentioned earlier. So uh, don't think there was a mention of the 3 billion investment into the UI trust fund. Are there measures under discussion to ensure smaller business owners, less than 10 employees, receive relief from this investment? Um, anything there, perhaps Tara or Didi? Uh, not that I'm aware of uh, on that, of that particular question. Gail, I don't think, well, yeah. I ask you if there's anything, but not that I know of. Not at this time. It's not in the governor's budget. There, the three billion you will see is is in the budget. I think I did hear it mentioned, but that is to pay down the the debt that we get once all the federal funding comes in. So um, it, it's a really good question, though, and and one we spend a lot of time thinking about. So thank you for asking it. But at this time, there's no additional proposal. Excellent. Thank you. See here, we're getting a question about um, uh, vision and where we see uh, growth in GOBIS. So great to see investments in economic development programs continue. GOBIS is taking on more and broader responsibilities under the past budget. And this one, will we be expanding the team? And is there a strategic plan on growth for Didi? Uh, well, we are expanding uh, our scope of responsibilities and our team in uh, conjunction with that as we get additional responsibilities. We do like to make sure that we have the right team and the right pers personnel uh, and resources to support the additional responsibilities that we're asked to take on. So um, in last year's budget, we were asked to take on an energy unit, which we're working on in this year's budget, in addition to expanded functions within the groups that we have, for example, OSBA, Tara and her team obviously are working hard uh, to manage the additional benefits for our small business community. Um, Tyson, same thing as we expand our commitment to zero emission vehicles, particularly making sure that you know, access is equitable uh, and that all communities are served. Obviously the ZEV team is working hard on that. Uh, we heard about some increased responsibilities for our international team uh, today. Um, always, we were always growing our programs. We, we, last year we got this, the um, Cal Competes grant program alongside the existing Cal Compete tax credit program. So, you know, I think that, the, that GoBiz is, uh, you know, as the Office of Business and Economic Development, we're always looking for ways that we can step in to support our business community and some of the adjacent functions that provide the right business environment. And we wanna make sure that we do that in a way that uh, allows us to serve you, our customers, as effectively as, as possible. So, but we're excited about the new responsibilities we have this year. Um, and we look forward to uh, you know, doing all we can to make sure, again, the environment for, for businesses is as good as it can be and that we are a, a, a portal and an accessible one uh, for, for the wide range of, uh, of needs that our business community brings to us. Thank you, Didi. An additional question for you. What are you the most excited about in this budget to support the biotech and life sciences industry growth in the state? Well, I, I'm very excited about the restoration of the R&D tax credit and the NOL provision. Uh, I think that's something I've heard about from not just the life sciences uh, uh, sector, although given the two years that we've had, I think we've never been more, uh, you know, each of us more personally aware of the invaluable role that the life sciences play and the industry plays. And we want to keep that R&D here in California. We want to bring as much manufacturing in that sector to California as we can. We want to keep working uh, with you um, to provide the best home. And we are between the Bay Area and San Diego and other parts of the state. You know, we have the second biggest life sciences uh, sector in the country. We'd like to be the biggest. Uh, so I, I'm very excited about that. And I think, you know, we think of, we at GoBiz think of our economy as an innovation economy. Um, we, are, we are the place where new ideas are born 
and where they come to commercialization and where they bring new benefits and new services to people's lives. Um, and we wanna make sure we keep that innovation culture alive and well and things like the R&D tax credit and these new other tax credits that we have that are aimed toward clean energy and some of the industries of the future um, are, are really, really important. And so that's something I think, and you know, certainly our, our, the success of our, of our ZEV industry here is a, is a great example. The success of our, of our life sciences industry here is another great example. So anyway, we're excited about a lot of things, including those. Thank you for your question. Thank I could you. go on a long time about that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a quick question here for me regarding the 450 million through your program that was referenced on county resiliency and where additional information may be found. So more information will be made available in the coming weeks on that as it is a plus up to the SERP program that was discussed earlier. Alignment with the federal funding rules are needed prior to finalization of program details. For more information, though, you can go to so page 78 of the eight pages. Uh, we will link it in the chat. Um, that's where we, we can definitely refer you to some more information on that, but more to come. Um, and then we are just about out of time. So we're going to do one more question. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Tara. If you can summarize efforts to target funding to micro businesses. Oh, great question. We are in the process of implementing right now $50 million um, one-time investment from the um, uh, previous budget uh, directly aimed at relief for micro businesses. Uh, we are in the process of letting 26 uh, grant agreements to counties um, that will be standing up outreach and engagement um, programs to um, get $2,500 relief checks in the hands of micro businesses that are earning less than $50,000 a year and less than um, five employees. So that is a very specific targeted effort that is ongoing right now. Fantastic. Thank you, Tara, for that response. And I do see we do have a few questions still in the queue. Um, again, we uh, want to be respectful of everyone's time. And so if we did not get to your question, our team um, has added a link to the chat that will direct your question to the appropriate staff member. We will respond to those who have already submitted questions. So you don't have to do anything else extra. But for anyone that didn't have a chance to throw something out there, please follow up with that link and we will respond appropriately. Uh, if you have further questions, uh, GoBiz will be hosting additional briefings this week. Please follow us on social media to receive notifications and links to register. Links to our platforms have been added to the chat. We also encourage you to sign up for our newsletter where additional resources are available, including a recording of this webinar and a link to register uh, has already been added to the chat. So you should be able to find that here. Um, and with that, again, thank you all very much for taking the time to join us today as we talk through and, and continue to, to develop some of these exciting uh, programs um, for, for our economic development and, and recovery. So very excited to talk through these today and thank you for joining us. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, finance.